Um, I want to start off <laughs> with a really funny video. Uh, actually, I'm not going to show you the video. I'm just going to show you a couple of pictures of it. But, but how many of you, um, <laughs> I, I, I know, I think I know the answer, but, but how many of you know that there's something special, something heavenly, something super anointed when friends take masa and they stuff it with meat Whoa. and they wrap it Dude. Oh. In a, and come out with a tamale. Oh, I mean, there, there is something special. I, I think, you, you know, I may have to go back and do some searching. I, I, I don't know, is it tamale or is it tamana? Because, I mean, tamales are just so, so delicious. Oh, you get those hungry again, man. Oh, man, man, man. It's that time of year, too. It's that time of year, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But there was a young lady, I don't know if you guys saw this or not, there's a young lady. And this young lady, she is talking about how awesome all of her friends are saying tamales are. She's never had one, but she's excited about the opportunity to get into a tamale, right? So she's talking about, man, I, you know, all my friends, they love them, and, 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 and I, I can't look forward, and I'm so excited. And so she see her, and she's, she's going through all these muscles. She grabs this tamale. Huh. It's like, man, she's in for a treat, right? And here she is. She, she's getting ready to go. And she grabs it. She picks it up. Now, I see some of y'all laughing. Some of y'all already understand what the issue is right here. Right? Right? She takes a big, huge bite. But y'all can see. Oh, girl. She bit into the what? The husk, the, 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 the outside, right? Yeah, she's not too happy about that. That's not the face we normally make when we eat tamales. So, so here's the problem. Watch this. She bit into the husk or the wrapper because she had never eaten them before. No one had told her or showed her how to eat a tamale. Now, after a few tries, she eventually figured it out and got it right. And she went to work. But now here's the thing. As silly as that may seem, or as unrealistic as it may seem, it is remarkably similar to us and our relationship with the Word of God. You see, because many of us, when it comes to the Word of God, many of us don't know how to unwrap it and eat it. And you see, since we don't know how to unwrap it, and since we don't know how to eat it, we end up taking these big bites of it that we can't seem to digest. And what happens is that many of us end up starving because we don't know how to eat. There's an old saying that goes, you are what you eat. Y'all heard that before, right? Well, that's true. I'm going to add to that, and that's going to be the title of my message today. And it's simply this. You are what you eat if you eat. You are what you eat if you eat. Will you say that with me? You are what you eat if you eat. So, now, when it comes to eating, physically, I would say that the majority of us probably eat three meals a day. Some two, some four, right? But it's pretty safe to say, I can't be the only one, that we aren't missing any meals. Right? As a matter of fact, some, some of y'all may be squeezing some snacks in there. I put that midnight. I, I mean, y'all. Yeah? yeah. So, 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 so physically, uh, we are eating uh, three meals a day. But let me ask you this. How are we feeding our spirit man? How often are we feeding our, 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 our spirit man? Are we feeding him three times a day? Hmm. Uh, are we feeding him once a week? 
I, I, I'm going to feed him on Sunday morning. Hmm. <laughs> I, I ate one time. Sunday morning. What do you do Monday? Oh, no, no, no. Tuesday? No, no, I don't eat on Tuesday. Wednesday? No. Mm -mm. You feed your spirit one time a week on a Sunday morning. Now, what happens is this, is that there are way too many malnourished believers yeah, amen. walking around all underweight because we don't know how to get past the wrapper and eat the word. Okay. You see, if you are studying along with us in this study, you'll, you, you're going to figure out, you know, it'll, it'll really get in depth of what is God's word. But I want to take a little different path today. And I want to tell you why it is that we need to uh, take in the word and how we should do it. So I could go around this room and I could ask all of us, why is it that you should study the word of God? And all of you will have a different answer. and You would all probably be correct. But I want to just kind of narrow this down a little bit. You say, why is it that we should study the Word of God? Well, it comes down to this. We should read the Word of God to know God and to know His will. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Right? Uh, we, we can say a lot of things, but it all comes down to the reason that we need to study the Word of God is to know God and to know His will. Because the, the, the question is this, if we don't know God and we don't know His will, how then uh, can we, uh, well, let me say it like this, the more we know God, right, the more we can love Him. Right? Yeah. right? But it's hard for us to love him if we don't know him. Right, right, right. So if we're not studying his word, if we're not digesting, if we're not taking his word in, it is difficult for us to know him and to fully love and appreciate him. We see a lot of different descriptives all throughout the word telling us about itself. Uh, the word of God, uh, the word tells us the word of God remains forever. Amen. The word of God is forever. The word of God will never pass away. The word of God is truth. The word of God, the Bible tells us, is living and active Amen. and is sharper than any two-edged sword. Yeah? That's what the Bible says. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. In other words, uh, y'all know what it's like. Y'all got those butter knives at home, right? Right? Uh, butter knife, what? The back side of it can't do nothing with it, right? You got a little bit on the front side you can do something with it. Right? But the word of God is not like a butter knife. Right. The Bible says it is like a two-edged sword. In other words, it cuts going in and cuts coming out. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. In other words, the Word of God, it cuts when we give it out in truth and when we receive it in truth. Amen? So let me just show you real quick a couple of things that the Word of God does. First of all, the Word purifies. Purifies. Say it with me, purifies. Yeah. The Bible says this in Psalm 119, verses 9, 9 through 11. It says this, how can a young person, or an old person for that matter, stay pure? By obeying your word. I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have what? Hidden your word in my heart, in my heart that I won't sin against you. I have digested, I have eaten your word, and it is inside of me, and because it's inside of me, I will not trespass against you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here's the truth about us when it comes to taking in the word of God, and it's true for all of us, and it's simply this. The word of God will not work through you if it's not in you. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, simple. It won't work through you if it's not in you. Yeah. See, I'm not going to. I'll just say it like this. So some of us, we, uh, we hope to get the word of God through osmosis. <laughs> well, I'm just going to sleep with it open beside my bed. And then I trust that it's going to transfer. Yeah. All right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 
Okay, okay. There, I'll leave that alone. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so, again, it can't work through us if it's not in us. The word purifies. Say that with me. The word purifies. The word purifies. But you know what else the word does? The word prospers. The word prospers. Huh. Oh, I knew it. He's one of those prosperity preachers, isn't he? Oh, hallelujah. God's going to give you a white Cadillac with a no, I'm not talking about any of that foolishness. What I'm talking about is a biblical definition of what it means to prosper. Because you see, when I grew up, my grandmother wasn't the wealthiest woman by far, but she was one of the most prosperous women I'd ever met. Why? Because let me give you the definition of what it means to prosper. And that's what the word does for it. To prosper is simply this, to flourish to thrive, to grow, to be strong, to be healthy. So in other words, the word does that for us. The Bible tells us in Psalm chapter one, verses one through three, it says this. It says, how blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. He doesn't stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the what? The law. law of the Lord. And he, watch this, he meditates day and night on it. And because he meditates, he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which will yield its fruit in season and his leaf does not wither. And whatever he does grows. Whatever he does thrives. Whatever he does is strong. Whatever he does prospers. Joshua says it like this. Joshua chapter one, verse eight. He says it like this. In talking to the Lord, after the Lord tells him, be strong and courageous, Joshua, be strong and courageous. He says this. God tells him, study this book of instruction continually. Say continually. continually. Meditate on it. Here it is again. Day and night. So you will be sure to obey everything written on it. Only then will you do what? Prosper, Prosper and succeed in all that you do. So are you seeing a pattern here? Yes. Are you seeing a pattern as far as consistency goes? Now watch, he doesn't say in the Bible, he doesn't say, I need you to study the Bible 24 hours a day. If he wanted that, he would have put it in here. Right? He says day and night. In other words, meditate on it day and night. So in other words, darling, when I'm at the school, I can be working, but guess what? I can still be meditating on his word. I can be at the gym working out, but guess what? I can still be meditating on his word. I can be over at Five Star getting a cut from Rick, and guess what? I can still be meditating on the word. Amen? And so, and so, I, I can be driving. Don't go there, man. I can be driving. I'm convicting myself right now. No, tell me about it, man. And I should be meditating on the word. Amen. Yeah. I know. I'll just say ouch. I'm not even gonna say amen. I'm just gonna say ouch. So again, the, the frequency. So here's the thing. Maybe you're dealing with something in your life right now and you don't see prosperity. You don't see it prospering. You don't see it growing. You don't see it thriving. Well, maybe you need to look at your schedule. Maybe you need to see, well, hey, am I meditating on his word day and night or am I just eating on Sundays? Yeah. You see, because maybe if it's day and night, it'll kick some things in. So, number one, again, the word does what? The word purifies and the word prospers. And the last thing that I'm going to talk about today is simply this, is the word protects. The word protects. Say it with me. The word, the word protects. protects. 
What does the word protect us from? Temptation. Anybody suffer with temptation? Yeah? Okay, three of us? Okay. All right, well, I'm going, yeah, four or five, okay, yeah. Well, I'm going wherever y'all go, because I need to go to the non-temptation place of Vegas, wherever y'all stay, because, um, again, temptation, we are protected by the word against temptation. We see this played out beautifully in probably the best illustration in, 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 in Scripture when Jesus goes to the wilderness in Luke chapter 4. Right. Luke chapter four. You may not know the story, but it's real quick. Here's Jesus. And after uh, he's beginning his ministry, Jesus goes out to the wilderness for 40 days. He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So this brother is tired and he's hungry. Not only is he tired and hungry, but after the 40 days, guess what? Old Slewfoot and Satan, he shows up talking about, uh, hey, Jesus, I got something for you. I know you're hungry. I know you haven't eaten in 40 days. So I'll tell you what, why don't you, uh, hey, it's just between me and you. I won't tell nobody. Go ahead, take that stone there and make it bread. I'll throw in some butter. Right? You're good. You take care of your needs. Take care of your flesh. Now, how many of you know after 40 days, <laughs> so, but watch what Jesus says. Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Right? right? right. Now, think about this. Here's Jesus, and Jesus doesn't say, okay, hey, Satan, look, in the future in Luke chapter four, I'm going to say this. No. He says then, the scripture says. So what's he referring to? Right. Right? What's he referring to? I'll show you what he's referring to. He's referring, when he says, people do not live by bread alone, Jesus is referring to Deuteronomy chapter 8. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says this. It says, yes. He humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do what? Not, Not live by bread alone, but we live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Huh. Right, right, right. So Jesus is tempted and he relies on scripture with the physical desires. But how many of you know the devil don't give up that easy? Oh, come on. Right. Right. So old devil comes back. He says, listen, I'm going to take you up to the highest place in all the land. And I'm going to give you glory. Anything you see, you know what? I'm going to let you have it. I'm going to let you have it because these are mine to give whoever I want it to. So you know what? I'll tell you what, we'll make a little trade. I'll give you everything you see if you worship me. If you worship me. Now here's Jesus, hungry, tired. And the first thing Jesus says is the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord and serve him only. Again, what's he talking about? Where's he quoting? Well, he's quoting Deuteronomy 6. 6.13, it says, you must fear the Lord your God and serve him only. When you take an oath, you must use only his name. Huh. Okay. Okay. Huh. So, Satan's not done. How many of you know when Satan comes at you, he usually doesn't do it just once right. or twice. <laughs> He'll keep coming until he can try to find a way in. So, we see him come back a third time. And, and the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point in the temple. He says, if. Say if. 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 In other words, I'm going to put some doubt in that. I'm doubting your purpose. I'm doubting your calling. I'm doubting how you were created. So if, if, if you are the son of God, jump off. Well, the scriptures say, since you want to quote scripture, scriptures say he will order his angels to guard you and protect you. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus, who even though he may want, 
hard to say, you know what, let me just step out of this whole Messiah Savior thing so I can just tell you something about yourself. No, he didn't do that. <laughs> right. right? That's a word right there. He didn't do that. He didn't, what did he say? It is written. The scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. In other words, he went to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. And what he said was, you must not test the Lord your God as when you complained at Nasa. You see, so what we see here, there are three temptations, right? Satan comes at him three times. And all three times, Jesus never, ever Trust his own feelings. Oh, that's big. That's right. big. He never trusts his own opinion. Right. right. You see, even though he was God and man, he, he, he didn't want to get into that man part. So he just said, I'm going to stick with what the scripture says. Right. Amen. See, never does Jesus say, well, let me tell you what I think. <laughs> Never does Jesus say, well, let me give you my opinion. Never does Jesus say, well, you know, the research would suggest. Uh-uh. He simply relies on the word. On the word. Now, see, when we get in this situation, what do we do? We want to come up with our opinion, with what we think. Well, you know, I feel, I, you know, I, I just really feel like, uh, you know, my heart is telling me. Um, um, we rely on so much stuff beyond the word of God. And then finally, after everything else doesn't work, oh, well, well, let me see if this will. So remember, the word purify, say it with me, purifies. Purify. The word prospers, Prosper. the word protects. Protect. So, all right, what I want to do is I want to take the next few moments I have with you, and I want to equip you. Can I do that? Yeah. I want to equip you because I don't want to sit up here and tell you, well, hey, I want you to start or you need to read the word of God because you need to eat. And I don't want to tell you what you need to do without telling you how to do it. Amen. All right. Good. So how do you start? How do you start to eat? How do you start to digest this? How do you start to take this in? The very first thing you need to do, the very first thing you need to start with is a prayer and a plan. Good. Amen. All right. Amen. Yeah. You need to start with prayer and a plan. So I know if any of y'all are honest, that y'all have done the same thing that I have done on more than one occasion. Who? I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to be good. I'm going to start the new year off. I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover. Starting Genesis. I'm pumped up every day. Yeah. And then about February, <laughs> when I get into Leviticus. <laughs> and they cut their toe. They did what? And they, I get and then I got to start, I did like, how many of y'all had them false starts where you thought, oh, oh it's just, okay, thank y'all three for, thank y'all for being honest this morning. Remember, God looks at the heart. He knows, he knows, he knows. So let me give this to you. Um, again, what I would suggest, if you were to come to me as a pastor, I, I, what, I, I want to I wanna start eating. I want to read the Bible. What do I do? I'm going to tell you, start with the Gospels. All right. yeah. sure. Start with the Gospels. Yeah. Start with the Gospels because I talked about the life of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Right? Yeah. Start with John. Read the other. How, but it talks about the life of Jesus and it talks about his miracles. Right? From there, I would tell you to go to Proverbs. Read Proverbs. It's all about wisdom. All about how we should live our lives. Then, after reading Proverbs, I would send you to Romans. Right? I would send you to Romans because it deals with salvation. It deals with eternal life. It deals with what happens. Uh, how you can get saved and how you don't have to worry and live your life scared. Am I going to go to hell? or not? No, deal with Romans. Then after that, I would point you to Ephesians. 
It's one of my favorite books. Because Ephesians talks about your identity in Christ. Who you are, now that you're saved, now that, 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 you're, that you have eternal life, what is your identity in him? So I'd point you to Ephesians. After that, you got to take a stop in James. Because James really tells you how to live, how to walk it out, your faith. And then finally, I would send you the Psalms. Love the song. Right? I'm just giving you a starting point. Because, you see, by the time you get through the Psalms, you're going to see every scenario, every possibility. You're going to see what to do when you're up. You're going to see what to do when you're down. You're going to see what to do when you're rejoicing. You're going to see what to do when you're on the verge of depression and your suicide. You're going to see all of that in the book of Psalms. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Am I helping you today? Yes, you are. Amen. Amen. So, last thing, and then I'm going to finish. Um, there's one important word as we're talking about eating, as we're talking about digesting, as we're talking about taking in his word. There's one important word that you've got to know beyond anything else. And you know what that word is? What? Context. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Context. Right. Yeah. Come on. You have to understand the scripture in context. We talked about this in our Bible study on Wednesday night, right? Y'all that were here on Wednesday night, y'all know. First Corinthians chapter 14, right? What does it say? All you women <laughs> be silent in church. Don't say anything. If you want to know something, get home and ask your husband and let him explain it to you. I'm waiting for it. Gil, don't you say amen. You better keep your mouth closed right now, brother. Now, we read that. And can I tell you, it has been too long that people have misappropriated that scripture have misused that scripture, have abused women who have been called to ministry because they stand on this and don't understand it in its proper context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to teach you about context in here in just a second. But basically, what you don't know about 1 Corinthians 14 is at the time, the Corinthian church was buck wild. Okay, I mean, it was brand new. They were just bouncing off the walls. I mean, in the midst of worship service, you have some people over there doing this, and these women were over here doing that. And, and Paul was like, let me address all of this mess. So he was writing to the women at that church. Not all of you. Is that, that, if that was the case, the church had to shut down. Come on, come on. Right. There's a lot of chicks right. in here. I'm saying church is, church is it's, it's 80 percent women. Yeah, right. Right. So, again, context. So I'm going to give you how to understand context. Okay. Yes. All right. Here we go. So, to understand context, you have to stop. Say it with me. Stop. Stop. To understand context, you have to stop. Stop. What do we mean? I'm going to explain it to you. It's an acronym. Stop. First thing, as you're reading, always read the verse before and after. Right? Don't, don't just jump in there and pull one thing out and be like, uh. Right? That's not proper context. Right? Read and then understand what the Bible says. It's an entirety about this one particular subject. Right? So, context. So, S. Say yes. S. First thing when understanding context is to understand the situation. S, the situation. What is the situation? In other words, when I'm looking at this text, what am I observing? What do I see that's going on? What is happening in the text? Right? What's the situation? 
That will tell me and help me understand the proper context. When I look at 1 Corinthians 14 again, okay, he's writing to the church at Corinth. He has all of these behavioral issues going on. He has all of this uh, uh, other gods that are, uh, I understand. That's the situation he is writing to. So first thing is to understand the situation. Next thing, T, say T. T. The type of literature. The type of literature. What do you mean? Well, those of you who've been in our Bible class, you understand that the Bible is written differently in different parts, right? There are the historical books. Amen? There are books of poetry. There are books of law. There are books of prophecy. There are books that are letters to this church or that church. And even in the midst of all of that, we see that sometimes Jesus speaks in parables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these aren't truths. These aren't, these aren't things that actually happen. But Jesus is, is relaying a spirit, like an illustration as a spiritual truth. Right. Right. right? right. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand the T, the type of literature. Next thing, say oh, oh, we need to understand the object, the object. In other words, who is that written to? Good. Right? We have to understand who is that written to. The thing that, and I say this all the time, the thing that we have to understand about the Bible is this, is the Bible was written, it was written for us, but not to us. You hear me? Yes, it was written for us, but not to us. In other words, when Paul was sitting there writing down his letter to the Corinthians, he was like, well, I'm going to write this letter so in 2024, Robin Farwell will understand exactly what I'm saying. No, <laughs> he's writing it to the church at Corinth. Now, in the context of this, there's stuff that we can all use that's for us, right? right? But it's not written to us. Right. So we have to understand who the object of this letter is. And the last thing is P. Say P. P. We have to understand in context when we read scripture, is it prescriptive or is it descriptive? Do you understand? Is it prescriptive or is it descriptive? So in other words, is it telling me exactly what to do or is it describing something I should do? Huh. Is it describing a truth using an illustration? So, for example, if Miss Brenda goes to the doctor, she is going to go and the doctor is going to give her a prescription. It's going to say, take this medicine for X many days. It's going to give her specific instructions. You're not going to go to your doctor and say, oh, this is wrong with me. Oh, well, let me just give you kind of a description of what you should. No. Right. I need something specific. Don't give me something general. Okay. Right. Okay. And so when we see scripture, we have to understand, is he prescribing something specifically for us to do? Or is he giving us a general description? Let me give you an example. Okay. Something prescriptive. You want to know how to get saved? Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. If you believe in your heart, right? That Jesus died and he was raised from the dead, right? If you believe and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Amen. That's a prescription for salvation. Amen. Got it? Everybody understand? Yeah. Now, let me give you something descriptive. Okay? And this is why you can't take the Bible literally. You have to understand this. In some cases. Um, when it comes to dealing with sin, right? What does Jesus say? It's better that you pluck your eye out. Right? The Bible says that. It does. You shall pluck your eye out. Cut your hand out. All of this stuff. Okay, can we just be honest? Yeah. If it came to a matter of sin and plucking our eye out was prescriptive, <laughs> 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 
Watch it. <laughs> We'd be some blind jokers, right? Because we all wouldn't have any eyes. Right? So, in other words, when Jesus says, pluck your eye out, that is descriptive. Okay, I get it. Yes? Yeah, yes. Good analogy. So, as I close, I'm going to say this. All of these things, stop, helps us understand the proper context. I'm going to close with this. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says this, study to do your best to present yourself to God approved. A workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching, digesting, eating the word of God. When it comes to the spirit, like I said, you are what you eat and you are how much you eat. Amen.